Good evening, I'm Dolva Davis and welcome to This Week in Northern California. Joining me on our news panel, Eric Savage, West Coast Editor of Barron's on Google's move from mainland China. And Marisa Lagos, staff writer with San Francisco Chronicle with an update on state workers' furloughs. And Sarah Varney, reporter with KQED Public Radio on health care reform and what it means for California. So, Sarah, we start with you. Much of this debate has been about what's in it for me. So what's in it for California? Well, California has the largest number of uninsured in the country. We have about 8.2 million people. So the state certainly stands to benefit probably disproportionately than other states, for cert uh, certainly at that level. We'll have about five to six million people who will gain insurance through this new health care law. Um, they're wide estimates at this point, so because of a variety of reasons. But many of those people will gain coverage through a new Medicaid expansion. So Medicaid will be open to people who earn higher incomes than they do now. It'll be open. Um, uh, it'll also be open to people who are so-called childless adults, which is a really inartful term. But essentially, Medicaid has always been this program that's really been meant for for mostly mothers and children and the disabled. And so I think there's a lot of misconception about Medicaid that somehow if you're you know, poor, regardless of if you're poor, you get health insurance, which is not the case. So there'll be that change in the Medicaid program. There's also going to be um, very generous gov government subsidies for people to buy private insurance. Uh, it's going to go up to about 400% of the federal poverty level. So for a family of four that earns $88,000 a year, that's the top end at which you can qualify for some government subsidies. Um, there's a lot in here for employers, particularly for small businesses. There's about $4 billion in new tax credits to help small businesses offer health insurance to their employees. And um, there's also a lot of these individual market reforms, which I'm sure a lot of us have heard about. There's going to be this ban on uh, insurers not accepting you because you have a pre-existing condition. There's going to be a ban on uh, insurers charging you more because you're sicker or because you're older, because you're a woman, which was always the case before. And then also for really young, for young adults, there's a lot in there. I mean, we, obviously, we've we saw the unemployment numbers that came out this uh, this week. Uh, we're still at about 12 and a half, I think, percent unemployment in California. A lot of that are these, you know, younger people who are graduating from colleges and not able to find work. So those people will be able to, who are uninsured, will be able to go back on their parents' insurance policy up until age 26. Well, this was a bitter, bitter fight in the Congress. Uh, the Republicans had a forecast of uh, disaster if this passed. That was the politic of it. Now that the word is out and people are beginning to hear at least some of these upside things. How is it faring in the public view? I, I think people are going to find a lot in this to like. I think even in some of these more conservative districts where they had, uh, you know, Republican congressmen who voted against the bill, many of those districts have very high rates of uninsurance in California. Um, many of those districts have uh, older people who pre-Medicare age who are not able to get insurance, so they'll benefit from these new high-risk pools. That's actually one of the very first things that's going to go into effect within 90 days of when the bill was signed. So just in um, just in a, a couple months here, you will actually be able. To to apply for a high risk, uh, to the high risk pool. It's very unclear how it's gonna work at this point, but essentially it'll be much more affordable coverage. There'll be no lifetime cap. There'll be no annual cap on your medical expenses, which is very different how the state high risk pool works now. So I think as people, I mean, I've, as I was saying before we started the show, I've been getting calls and emails from listeners just here's my personal situation I'm 54 years old I drive a cab my son is 23 you know everybody really wants to understand kind of what's in it for them but a lot yeah. of this really isn't spelled out yet correct I mean there's a lot of things that need to happen before you know for example you could tell me exactly how it might affect me if I lose my job is that true? There's, well, there's, so the, the legislation certainly establishes sort of the broad outlines of the of the program, and then it, you're absolutely right that now Secretary Sebelius' office is very busy trying to interpret what the Congress actually meant, and they will have to go through and now write, you know, tomes of regulations that will get then sent out to other people who will write additional tomes of regulations. So yeah, it's, it's a process to certainly get this out into the public. So, well, so what's the uh, impact on the state budget? The governor's kind of come out and said he believes in health care reform, uh, but at the same time uh, there's there's a real impact on uh, the state budget, uh, uh, which is already, of course, uh, uh, in something of yeah. a difficult situation. So there's sort of two issues here. One is, you know, th there was this so-called corn husker kickback or whatever that was, you know, that there was somehow special treatment for certain states. That actually is now done away with in the reconciliation bill. So in the reconciliation bill, all states are treated the same, and there are they increase the subsidies to the states. So for the first six, about six years of this program, of this Medicaid expansion, of 
uh, uh, the high risk pool, all these things are actually 100% federally paid for. Mm -hmm. It is, and also there is an increase in, um, a required increase in reimbursement rates to primary care physicians, which has been a big problem in California. You know, we are 49th in terms of our reimbursement rates to physicians in our Medicaid program. So this will greatly increase the reimbursement rates. It is true that after six years or so, those subsidies, the state will have to take on more responsibility, mm -hmm. those subsidies. It'll still be a, a federal state sh uh, split eventually. But, but you are correct in that the bill does say that the states have to have a maintenance of effort in their public insurance program. So in our Medicaid program, for instance, the legislature couldn't reduce eligibility, for instance, to save, save money to close the budget deficit. They can't eliminate the Healthy Families Program, which is a program for the children of low income, working poor families who are, earn just too much to qualify for Medicaid. Which is so what the governor will, wanted to do. To that will call, yeah, he had proposed eliminating that program. I'm not sure how serious he was about that. I think it was a bit more of a but he can't do it. And then there was, the, on the add-ons, <laughs> the odd bills that came after yeah. the major legislation, there was big news about Pell Grants and making it easier for students in California, particularly, go to college. This is true. And I should say, I'm, I'm, I'm the health reporter, so I, tend to, <laughs> I have to, there, the bill was big enough in terms of it, what, what, how it was going to affect the healthcare system, so I, I don't know I enough about I love the about. title, the health care bill at, with right. the educational right. pluses. Well, clearly that I was guess. something the Democrats, you know, it was a priority for them, and mm -hmm. they, they knew that this reconciliation um, vehicle was the way they were going to get it through the Congress, and so mm -hmm. that's the way they did it. Mm -hmm. So all the legislative things that have to be done have been done. done. Now it is. The president the has manager. to sign the reconciliation bill. Ah, he has That's, not done that. He has yet. not done that. That doesn't seem like a problem. No, I don't think that we're <laughs> going to have a problem getting him to sign that. Well, the governor's, uh, we talked about him <laughs> going off and on. We're now going to move directly to where he is really the guy. So, Marisa, the governor not only halted uh, the, gov the judge's order about uh, really stopping furloughs for state workers, but he also vetoed some legislation that would have done this. So what ground is he standing on to do this? Uh, executive authority, essentially. Um, this is, you know, one of more than two dozen lawsuits that have been filed over the past year over these employee furloughs. Originally furloughed about 238,000 state workers. Uh, the lawsuit this week dealt with about 65 to 75,000 of them. And what it really um, was aimed at is folks that work at places that don't get their money from the general fund, the DMV, Caltrans, um, the employment office. And what the judge said was that this is causing harm and that these employees should get back pay and that they should go back to work. Now, the governor um, has promised to appeal this decision on Monday. If he wins that appeal, which he is, of course, confident he will, uh, these folks will have to stay home next Friday. If he loses or if the appeals court says we need some time to really look at this, folks could be staying home. Now, you're right, the next day, he also decided to veto a piece of legislation by the Senate pro tem president, Daryl Steinberg. That would have applied to mostly these same workers and about 15 or 20,000 more that work at places that actually collect money, like the Franchise Tax Board um, and those sorts of places. So we're really looking at a long battle that is has kind of no end in sight other than the fact on the legal front. Now, the governor has said, proposed in his next year's budget, which begins July 1, he doesn't want these furloughs to continue. He'd like to see state workers pay cut. So that'll be a whole nother fight. But right now we're really seeing um, all of this being adjudicated. And a lot of questions remain. What's going to happen if the employees continue to win, which they have, if the appeals court, if the Supreme Court agrees, will the state owe more than a billion dollars in back pay? So does it go past the appeal decision? Does the governor now have grounds to just say, we'll wait till the Supreme Court gets around to it? Or does the Supreme Court, do we even know if the Supreme Court will take we don't know, and, and really we're talking about a number of different cases, so that's part of the reason it's so confusing. But in general, what happens, what, what has happened, is that the ju judges have ruled in general in employees' favor, um, but then have stayed those orders pending appeal decisions. So in general, everyone's still at home, um, except for corrections workers, of course, who have taken this pay cut and technically been furloughed, but still been working because you can't close prisons. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that case alone could cost the state more than, I think, $40 million a month in back pay. I mean, we're really talking big numbers here. Um, and I think there's valid questions about whether this entire policy has been a failure. I mean, in addition to the issues about um, back pay, there's all these employees that are now not taking vacation time. They're going to cash that out at some point. Mm. So, you know, 
I think there's valid questions about whether they're kind of kicking the can down the road, so if, to if speak. If the court up upholds the, uh, 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 the, the, the idea that they have to stop the furloughs or mm -hmm. reverse the furloughs, will the governor propose some alternative way to save that cash? Are they going to cut jobs or do other things to, uh, to, to, take, a, a, to take some measure to re reverse the... I mean, it's hard to say on an immediate basis. I think, yes, obviously, uh, this one suit, uh, the governor's attorneys have said, would cost the state $140 million to send these guys back to work for the rest of the year. Um, I think what you'll probably see happen is a lot of threats of layoffs and things like that, but ultimately, they're just going to add this to the tab. I mean, let's not forget, the state has a $20 billion deficit right now that could grow or shrink, depending on a lot of different factors, but, you know, they don't kind of have to pay the same way we do. So there's always more cash going out than coming in at any particular time. So I think what you're going to see is legislators, lawmakers, um, and the governor's office have to make tougher decisions down the road. Well, the one thing we know is that if you cut hours to the degree where they are now, or if you cut employees <laughs> later on, services have really been impacted by this. They have. I mean, we're talking everything from longer lines of the DMV to people not getting their employment checks or not qualifying for disability as soon as they could have. So what folks like uh, the pro tem of the Senate have argued is this isn't just an issue about state workers. This is about the state economy. And I think that um, you've also seen uh, studies sort of debunking a lot of the governor's numbers saying, look, even if you're saving money on the front end, on the back end, you're losing, say, taxes we could have collected that now we can't because the statutes run out. So I think um, there are a lot of concerns about whether or not this is actually going to do more harm than good. Mm -hmm. And then we have the fact that the governor will go home near the end of this next year. That's right. I mean, somebody else's problem. It, it will be. I mean, really, especially when you look at things like vacation pay that's going to get cashed out, that could happen years from now. So the sort of full cost of these and impact will probably fall to the next governor, who that, whoever that may be. Mm -hmm. Well, our next story has to do with a giant move that could cost a lot of money, but this time in the private sector. So, Eric, Google has moved its operation from mainland China. What has been the, the reaction from other Silicon Valley companies and the Chinese government? Well, the other Silicon Valley companies have said very little, uh, as little as possible. Um, no one, almost no one, uh, has stepped up to uh, pat Google on the back and say, we're with you in solidarity and leave China with them. Um, to the contrary, uh, Microsoft and a number of other companies uh, who work in the technology business have basically said, we're staying in China. There's a big market. Um, we'll, we will work within their rules and try and make change from within. Um, so it's uh, there. Google's kind of standing alone here. Uh, there's one small company, uh, GoDaddy, which is a uh, uh, a company that registers domain names, but it's probably more famous for their Super Bowl commercials. I think um, that has said that they will stop registering Chinese uh, internet domains, but it's very small business for them. But none of the major companies are saying they're going to leave. How, what is Microsoft's response to this? Are they uh, um, are they pretty excited? Um, we'll well take that business. this is actually an opportunity for Microsoft. Yeah. Uh, Microsoft has a search engine uh, called Bing that has actually been doing better domestically. Um, they are less than 1% of the market in China, um, so they see some opportunity to gain some, some market share. But uh, Microsoft's position is we've been doing business in China for more than 20 years. Uh, we will continue to do business in China. And that's despite the fact that they are aware of the, uh, the, the restrictions and dangers of working there. There's a very high rate of piracy for uh, windows, for example, in, in China. Um, and so they are aware of the situation, but they believe that the market opportunity is so big Tell that they really a, can't a afford little not bit to be um, there. Uh, background on why Google made such a surprise move, we'll say. Well, so this really started in January. Um, uh, Google had been operating in China and had been censoring the search uh, search engine results as uh, the government had requested. Um, however, Google announced that they uh, discovered that their, uh, their website had been hacked uh, by parties in China. Uh, they didn't say that it was the government, but they certainly hinted pretty strongly that it was. Um, and in fact, what was happening was that someone had hacked into the uh, Gmail, Gmail, of course, is the, uh, the email service uh, from Google, uh, into Gmail accounts uh, held by uh, dissidents um, who were opposed to the Chinese government, um, and, and basically reading all of their email. Um, Google reacted by saying, you know, this is unacceptable. 
um, we're going to change our policy on, on censoring search. And uh, um, and th now we've gotten to the point where they're actually going to leave. Uh, at the time this happened, Google did say that uh, they were not the only uh, company that had been hacked, that there were maybe uh, 15 or 20 others. Um, the names are, uh, uh, have not really come out, and I think uh, no one has, else has stepped up to say uh, we're getting out and of China. what does this mean then for, for people inside of China, particularly I'm thinking of for academic researchers who rely on Google really to, go, to find journal articles, those sorts of things? I mean, what does the Internet look like for them now that they don't essentially have, a, have Google? Well, certainly Google was not the only search, en ser mm -hmm. search engine in China. Uh, the largest player is a company called Baidu, which is a local uh, Chinese search engine. And uh, there are a number of other players. Microsoft is there. Uh, Yahoo China is actually uh, a company that's uh, not owned directly by Yahoo, but does operate in China. And there are a few other local players. So you, ha you have other ways to find information. Um, interestingly, most of the coverage about the reaction within China has been that the majority of the citizenry uh, seems to be supportive of the government. Um, there is, however, um, you know, a sizable minority that thinks that this is a uh, uh, unfair and uh, uh, and not a good thing. So, so we're talking term. about one of the biggest markets, you know, that exists yes, potentially. Absolutely. Google's share of market, though, was not that great. So do they stand to lose a lot of money in the near future or on the long term? Well, so um, they were the number two player. They had about a third of the search uh, search engine market. Uh, but of course, the market in China is still, while growing fast, is still relatively small relative to the rest of Google's business. It's, uh, by some estimates, one or two percent of their revenue. So leaving China is not going to devastate uh, Google's bottom line. On the other hand, the opportunity in China um, on the internet, as in many other uh, areas of commerce, is tremendous. Uh, so uh, the question is whether if they walk away now, um, are they giving up huge upside if you look five or ten years down the road? Um, and it's a, it's a risk. Uh, that's why I think some people uh, would prefer uh, that Google had stayed, tried to find ways to work within the system, mm -hmm. and to find a, maybe a quieter way to uh, to, to uh, find some change. This week, though, Senator Durbin of Illinois held hearings in which he w thought he was going to get a lot of people from Silicon Valley there to talk about this. A uh, few people showed up. He's threatening or saying that he would like it if you were violating human rights laws that you could. Uh, yeah, she could send people to jail almost. Yes, well, you know, th this is some, the interesting thing is that uh, this is a, it is a huge business opportunity for everyone. And there have been other situations where other companies have had run-ins in uh, China. Uh, several years ago, Yahoo uh, got into a, uh, a situation where they were providing information uh, to the Chinese about a dissident who was, uh, uh, who was eventually jailed, and uh, they eventually left the market and basically sold their business to another company. Uh, so it, it's uh, you're not going to find too many people who are going to want to jump in and yeah. uh, and uh, take Google's side. I don't think. Well, my thanks to all of you for joining us here tonight.